In collaboration with Brain Mind, let's talk about exercise for optimal brain health and Alzheimer's prevention. If there is one single thing that you can do today to improve your mind, to optimize cognitive function, and reduce your risk of Alzheimer's disease, by far, hands down, the number one thing that you can do today is physical exercise. So let's dial it in a little bit. What do I mean by physical exercise? Taking 10,000 steps a day, right? That'll prevent Alzheimer's. Well, not so fast. Let's talk about intensity of exercise. We'll talk about types of exercise, and we'll talk about personalizing an exercise plan for you based on your own individual traits. So, having a sedentary lifestyle, sitting on the couch, sitting is the new smoking. If you haven't heard, people that sit for five to eight hours a day, it's like smoking several cigarettes a day. So being sedentary absolutely presses the fast forward button towards Alzheimer's disease and overall cognitive decline. Then there's being physically active. Being physically active and taking your 10,000 steps a day, that's all right. That can help with brain maintenance in some respects in certain people. But 10,000 steps a day is certainly not going to be enough to turn back the hands of time fight amyloid, reduce amyloid, and improve cognitive function. So let's transition now, not to physical activity, but physical exercise. When I think about exercise, I think about two primary types. Number one, cardiovascular exercise. And specifically, emerging evidence suggests that high intensity interval training may give you the best bang for the buck when it comes to brain health. Then the other type of exercise that I think about is weight training and resistance training. Building muscle mass is absolutely critical to optimizing and continuing brain function throughout the lifespan. So, how do we figure out which type of exercise is right for you and in what proportion? Overall, the guidelines state that at least 150 minutes per week is sufficient in order to at least make a positive impact on your brain. But again, I don't think that answer is so simple. Certain people need to know your numbers. How much body fat do you have? Where is the body fat? How much muscle mass do you have? Where is the muscle mass? Women, for example, may be preferentially responsive to losing body fat, especially body fat around the viscera or belly fat. Women that have excess body fat around the belly have a 39% increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. That is striking. Now, men are also impacted by body fat, but men may be more impacted by muscle mass. Building muscle mass is key. Everyone, as we age, especially after we get past the age of 65, we lose up to 1% of muscle mass per year. So the 10,000 steps ain't gonna cut it to build that muscle mass back up. Why is muscle mass so important? Building muscle mass speeds metabolism. When you can speed up metabolism, your body works better, your brain works better, and you can metabolize the nutrients that you eat and you can optimize brain function. So let's talk about all these different types of exercise and then also talk about some pitfalls. First of all, don't get hurt. Anyone that's watching this today that wants to get excited and say, you know what, I'm gonna take control of my brain health, I'm gonna start exercising today, take it slow. First of all, start by some simple stretching. Stretching is a way to at least get the body used to doing activities that you may not have been used to in the past. If you're already used to doing activity, that's great, but think about stretching. Think about stretching before exercise and also think about stretching after exercise as well. When it comes to resistance training and strength training, the key that I recommend to patients is controlled motor movements. For someone that's just adopting a new exercise program, using a circuit machine, for example, where you have controlled movements over time, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, three, four. The emphasis is building strength rather than necessarily building mass and power. We want lean muscles because lean muscle mass is by far the most metabolically active tissue in the body. When it comes to cardiovascular exercise, cardiovascular exercise is critical. How can you get a rough number on how cardiovascularly fit you are? Well, what is your resting pulse? Every single person out there needs to know what their resting pulse is. Believe it or not, people don't realize if you can, through cardiovascular activity, lower your resting pulse by one beat, you've just added three months to your lifespan. Three months. So if someone is starting an exercise program and your resting heart rate is in the 60s, you then lower it by, say, 10 beats over several years of active activity, 
That's a lot of extra months. That's years of longevity. And also, it's years of not just longevity and lifespan, it's extra years of brain span, health span, and quality of life. So when it comes to cardiovascular exercise, building up slowly is key. Even 10 minutes of fast walking is better than nothing. 20 minutes of jogging is better than 10 of fast walking. And honestly, we recommend in our program at least 30 to 45 minutes several days a week. The key here is that some people may be on the treadmill or on the elliptical, and they think they're getting their exercise for the day, but maybe they're texting or they're chatting on the phone. If you're able to speak on the phone during exercise or you're watching a movie or reading a book, you're probably not raising your heart rate enough to have a substantial effect. It takes at least 30 to 40 minutes to burn all the residual carbohydrates in your body. Once you start wanting to burn fat, which many of us want to do, we sometimes have to extend the cardiovascular exercise to 40, 45, and over time, 60 minutes per session. If you really want to press the fast forward button on the positive benefits of exercise, learn about high intensity interval training. High intensity interval training is a way where you get your heart rate up and you sprint, 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 go all out as fast as you can, and then slow down a little bit for a few minutes. And then you go all out as fast as you can again for 30 seconds, 45 seconds, whatever it is, and then you slow down a little bit again. All these different types of physical exercise stimulates different parts of the body and the brain. And the key about high intensity interval training is it stimulates the mitochondria. What are the mitochondria? These are the parts of the cells in the brain and the body that are the battery of the cell. If we can improve mitochondrial function, if we can improve the battery recharge of the cell, people will have more energy, people will feel better, and people will optimize their brain health over time. So exercise is by far the number one thing that anyone can do today to take control of their brain health. Think of it as a way to sprinkle miracle grow throughout the brain through a chemical that you stimulate. What is that miracle growth for the brain that anybody today can stimulate in their brain? It's called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Neurotrophic factor, I wanna repeat that. Neurotrophic, meaning you can grow brain cells. Yes, you heard it here first. As we age, the brain shrinks. As we age, the belly size gets larger, the memory centers of the brain get smaller. As we age, muscle mass declines. But if we can use exercise to stimulate BDNF, you can grow back brain cells. That's key. So to conclude, Rome wasn't built in a day. Take any exercise program steadily and slowly. If you have exercise-induced injuries, that's okay. See a physical therapist. Talk to your doctor. Take things slow. But over time, build up. Track. Tracking is absolutely key. When you understand what your average heart rate is per activity, when you understand what your resting heart rate is, when you understand what your maximum heart rate is, you can track these things over time in effort to optimize your human performance over the long haul. And finally, some days are good days and some days not so much. Oftentimes, exercise folks use trackers like this to understand if they're ready to take on cardiovascular strain. Sometimes people just don't feel right then guess what? Don't exercise that day. I use a wearable to tell me what my physiologic readiness is. Am I ready for strain? Well, that day I'll do exercise. If I'm not physiologically ready for exercise and I exercise that day because I was scheduled to exercise that day, I may get hurt and we don't want that. So the take home point here is number one, exercise, the most profound impact on your brain that you can have. And number two, know your numbers, know your internal clock. Because once you do an optimized exercise for you, you can have optimal brain health for the lifespan.